Hello everyone, today I'm going to give a lecture on linguistics and the components of language. The first component of language that we are going to focus on is phonology. Phonology is the study of the speech sounds of a particular language and of how speech sounds form patterns. Phonology tells us what sounds are in a language, how they do, and can combine into words, and explains why certain phonetic features are important to identifying a word. As an example of how sounds are organized, consider that the form of voiceless bilabial stop that is produced is dependent on where that phone is to be found. If it is found at the beginning of a word, the voiceless bilabial stop occurs as voiceless aspirated bilabial stop. For examples, pain, plan, pig, powerful, poinsettia, progressive, paint, If it is found in the middle of a word, the voiceless bilabial stop occurs as voiceless unaspirated bilabial stop, such as stupid, loophole, papering, approach, carpet, superficial, appendix. If it is found in the end of a word, the voiceless bilabial stop occurs as voiceless and released bilabial stop, such as stop, catch up, cap, keep, stirrup, flop, drop. As an example of how the production of sounds affects the way other sounds are produced, notice that in American English, when a phoneme t or d occurs in between vowels, they become a flap. If they are not in between vowels, they remain as they are. For examples, bid, bidding, bid. Bitter, lad, ladder, right, written, ride, writer, read, reader, let, lettuce, right, writer, lead, leader. There is an exception to this phenomenon, however, when the syllable containing the phoneme or d is stressed, the phoneme t or d does not change into a flap, even if they are between vowels. For examples, potato, redo, return, baton, redoubt, redundant. Notice in the example of the voiceless bilabial stop that its final form is determined by its place in a word. We know that it is a voiceless bilabial stop, but what we do not know is its aspiration. We're talking about the phoneme p here. Since not all the features of the phones are completely known, the phone is considered underspecified and is usually written with a capital letter T. We know that when we describe the con when we describe consonants, we we have three criteria. We have voicing, we have place of articulation, and we have the manner of articulation. Now the phoneme p or the consonant p it is we know that it's voiceless and it's bilabial, the place of articulation is bilabial, and we know that the manner of articulation is stop. But 
we cannot um, tell or we do not really know whether whether it's aspirated or unaspirated because we need to see its place where this a uh, phoneme or where this consonant is placed in in a word okay because in the given examples a while ago in the first one if it is written at the very beginning uh, i'm talking about this um phoneme p or p okay if it's written at the very beginning of the word okay there it's it's aspirated okay like plan okay there is a release of air and if it's in the middle okay it is unaspirated like for example loophole okay if it's at the end okay it's unreleased okay like for example the word is stop okay so there are differences okay between the the three okay so we do not really know whether it's aspirated unaspirated or unreleased okay so if that's the case it is called under specification a phoneme is a distinctive or contrastive sound in a language what distinctive means in this context is that the sound makes a difference in meaning and has communicative value for example for examples the phonemes s and z in terms of place of articulation, both of them are alveolars. Now, these two phonemes are separate phonemes because they produce a change in meaning between two otherwise identical words. In our examples, in the word sip and the word zip and bus and buzz race and raise now phonemes are phones that are significant enough to produce a change in meaning between two very similar words this is usually applied to two phones with the same place of articulation notice that the pairs of words in the previous slide are identical except in the place where the phonemes are placed. We say then that phonemes produce contrast in identical environments. Now, minimal pairs are the pair of words that are identical except in the place of the phonemes. Now, minimal pairs also have a pedagogical value because they are used to show second language learners that Two sounds are different from each other, especially when one of the sounds or phones is not present in the first language of these learners. And the following are examples of minimal pairs showing that the phonemes t and d are separate phonemes, such as in the words ten, den, tent, dent, pat, and pad. The phonemes p and b are separate phonemes, such in, such in the words like pit, bit, pet, bet, nap, and nab. You can set up a phonetic environment or a sequence of sounds such as an environment containing the sound sequence blank, at, and substitute different consonants in this slot. We can see if we get different words. If we do, then each of these consonants is a phoneme. The first one is pat. Second one, bat sat, mat, nat, fat, that, that, cat. Now we can conclude that the phonemes p, b, s, m, n, f, v, v, and k are all phonemes. 
This same concept of a minimal pair holds true for vowels as well. Consider, for example, a phonetic environment such as p blank t. Substituting different vowels in the empty slot, we can generate numerous minimal pairs. Examples pit, peat, hate, pot, pout, put, pot, pat, pet. We can conclude then that the short e, the long e, a, o, ow, o, a, and e are all distinct phonemes. If there are more variants of the same phoneme, we call these variants allophone. Allophone is a predictable variant of a phoneme. The phoneme p has three variants. The first variant is the aspirated p in the word pain. The second variant is the sound or the allophone p in the word carpet and aspirated. And the third variant is the allophone p unreleased in the word stop. Now these are all allophones of underlying phoneme. Allophones never occur in the same environment. These allophones are described as occurring in complementary environments. Allophone in complementary distribution. Each has its own position determined by the sounds that come before and after it, and that neither one ever occurs in the other's position. For example, in Filipino, we have these words, panghimagas, pambansa, and pantao. Now, in order for us to understand more, you just have to think, okay, whether if it's possible for us to replace the sound of m mm with m, with the, with the phoneme m mm in pambansa, for example, we cannot say, Pam himagas. We cannot say pan himagas. We cannot say pang bansa. We cannot say pang tao. So there, we have to consider. Okay, we have to consider the position. Okay, where uh, these allophones occur. When we talk about allophone in free variation, they alternate or vary without restriction or freely and that the speaker may use either one. For example, in Filipino again, in our language, we have the word babae and we also have the word babae. Now, uh, if you are going to replace either of the two, if you are going to use either of the two, the meaning of the word remains. It may seem obvious that sounds occur in words as a sequence A, B, C, D, E, F, but that isn't the whole story. Sounds are organized into syllables, and syllables are organized into words. Each word consists of one or more syllables, and each syllable consists of one or more sounds. Syllable is a phonological unit consisting of one or more sounds, and that syllables can be divided into two parts, a rhyme and an onset. A rhyme consists of a nucleus and any consonants following it. The nucleus is usually a vowel, 
Although certain consonants called sonorants can also function as a nucleus. Now, sonorants include nasals like m and n, and liquids like r and l. Any consonants following the nucleus as part of the rhyme are called the coda. And consonants that precede the rhyme in a syllable constitute the onset. Now, just take a look at the diagram that we have here. The only essential element of a syllable is the nucleus. Not every syllable has an onset and not every rhyme has a coda. That means that a single sound can constitute a syllable. Since a single syllable can constitute a word, a word can consist of a single vowel. To illustrate, we have here the word splint. The word splint is a one syllable word. The phoneme s, t, l are considered as onset. A short i is the nucleus. And the phonemes n, t, s are considered as coda. To give you more examples, let us have the, the one word or one syllable word first. The word is ton. The word ton, okay, its onset is t, the aspirated t, and then its nucleus is the carrot, or we call it also wedge, this one. And then its coda is the consonant or the phoneme n, ton. 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 The next example is the two syllable word even. Even. Now, th this word has two syllables. In the first syllable, as you can see, it has no onset, okay, and it has no coda over here. But it has only a nucleus, the long e. So that means that. Uh, a single sound can constitute a syllable, and this sound is the long e. The second syllable is composed of the phoneme v, mm -hmm. and then this one, the nucleus is the schwa sound, and then the coda is the phoneme n. Even, even. Our next example is a three-syllable word, loveliest, loveliest. In the first syllable, we have an onset, l, the nucleus, the wedge, this one, and then the coda is v. In the second syllable, the onset here is l, and then the nucleus is E, and it has no coda. In the third syllable, it has no onset. It has nucleus, the schwa sound, and then the phonemes s, t are the codas or the coda. So let me show you the interaction of phonology and morphology. Specifically, the English plural, possessive, and third-person singular morphemes. But I'm just going to focus on the English plural. Pronunciation of morphemes, plural. Now, if we're going to talk about the plural forms of these words, of course, we have to add S at the end of each word. Now that the sound of 
S there, the morpheme S. Differs among this group. For example, cab, cabs, bag, bags, bar, bars, cap, caps, back, backs, faith, faiths, bus, buses, garage, garages. Match, matches. Regular nouns have several pronunciations of the plural morpheme. If we are going to add the morpheme S to lip, it is read as lips. If we're going to add the morpheme S to seed, it is read as seeds. If we're going to add the morpheme S to fuse, it is read as fuses. Now, these are the allomorphs of the English plural morpheme. We have three categories. Okay, we have in the first column, we have bushes, judges, peaches, buses, fuses. In the second column, we have cats, tips, books, biffs, births. In the third one, we have pens, we have seeds, dogs, cars, rays. These lists indicate the pattern of distribution for the plural allomorphs of English. The schwa and z sound occurs on nouns ending in s, z, sh, j, ch. These are called sibilants. Number two, the s sound occurs following all other voiceless sounds. And the third one, the z sound or allomorph occurs following all other voiced sounds. To help us figure what is different between the phonological environments of the words that take the s and z and the schwa sound and the z allomorphs, we can actually look for minimal pairs, just like this one on your screen. We have cab and cap. Okay, the different the difference between the two is the the final sound b and Now, they differ only by their final sound. So, since each word takes a different allomorph, we can assume that the allomorph is selected based on the final sound of the noun, this one. The phoneme b, okay, or the, yeah, the phoneme b, okay, this consonant is voiced. So, therefore, if we're going to add the morpheme S, its plural form, uh, it will be read as cabs. On the other hand, if we're going to add S in here, the plural form, okay, since the final sound of the final sound here, P, this phoneme, is voiceless. So therefore, the, the the sound of s here the morpheme s is s. so we have caps so this one cabs this one caps continue on your screen you will see here the allomorphs z s, and schwa z now the allomorph z can be seen or can be used after the phonemes b, d, g, v, v, m, n, n, l, r, a, and oi.
while the allomorphs can be used after the phonemes t, t, k, f, and f. And then lastly, the allomorph, the schwa sound, and the z. So it can be used or can be heard after the phonemes s, sh, z, j, ch, and j. So we can make generalizations about the environment in which each allomorph occurs based on knowledge of natural classes. So we have here the allomorph z occurs after voiced non-sibilant segments. Okay, this one is sibilant. So these um these are voiced non-sibilant uh, phonemes. And then the allomorph s occurs after voiceless non-sibilant segments. And the schwa, okay, the schwa, and then the z occurs after sibilant segments. So these are all sibilants. You may be surprised to know that our rules for deriving the plural forms of regular nouns have wide applicability in English. For two other extremely common inflectional morphemes of English, namely the possessive marker on nouns and the third person singular marker, marker on verbs, the distribution of their allomorphs is parallel to the distribution for plurals. Let's take a look at these examples. So these are all possessive morphemes on or possessive morpheme on nouns. So we have, um, of course, you have to add apostrophe. So like for example, the word is ship and then apostrophe s, then cat apostrophe s, jack apostrophe s. Same goes for John apostrophe s, arm apostrophe s, dog apostrophe as so it it's similar so like for example the ships cats it's jacks like for example jack's um bag or jack's uh, books so and this one the allomorph z, z okay so like john's okay, john's book john's bag arms like that and then dogs for example the dog's food and then for uh the schwa and then z sound we have uh the the churches the judges and the fishes all right so there but for the third person singular morpheme on verbs okay so we have, of course, we're just going to add uh, S. Like, say, for example, she leaps, she eats, he kicks, he loves, like that. And, uh, of course, for this one, um, she hurries, she seems, she leans, he craves, he sees, like that. And for these verbs, okay, she preaches, he teases, um, he judges, like that, buzzes, rushes, like that. Okay. Now, the inflectional morpheme that marks the past tense of regular verbs in English has three allomorphs also. Okay. So this one, um, we have t, d, and schwa, and d, okay? So for example, the past tense of wish, okay, of course, we're going to add ed, right? Okay, we're going to add ed, but then, you know, the pronunciation or the sound 
is different. Okay? So, for example, um, wished, kissed, talked, stripped, preached. Then the second one, of course, the sound is d, waved, bathed, played, lied, steered, teased, roamed, ruined. Then the last one is the schwa sound. And then d, of course, wanted, waited, waited, hooded, planted, seated. Right. All right. Thank you very much. That's all for today's lecture. And uh, if you have questions, just post your questions in our Google Classroom. Or maybe you can just type your questions in the comment section. Okay. So thank you very much. And see you next uh, meeting.